Okay, I'll go to there and to uh, here, except I don't really want that slide to show. Uh, share. We gotta yeah, get off there. of that. Gotta get off of that one. Gotta get off of that one. Gotta get off of that one. Here, there's a safe one. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, that's the end of the slideshow. That those slides were at the end. Now we're at the beginning, and I don't think they registered. But um, oh, it was uh, it was challenging to think of how to approach this and. You really, I think, you know, if you're interested in ecology, then you are led to the dynamics of the planet. That's what, you know, a garden is, you're, you're, you're imitating the dynamics of ecosystems and, uh, and it leads to a big story. And I, so I didn't, I wanted to read more than I did. I have a book called The Soul, the Soul of the Soil downstairs. I had never really even cracked it, but I did do some reading and boy, wow, reading about soil is an eye opener, a real eye opener. And maybe there, you know, it comes up in here. We've talked about it a little bit and I'll talk about it a little more today. It's just such a dynamic ecosystem, so completely full of life and it's surprising. And, and, the, and so then the things that we've heard most of our lives about how our industrial agriculture abuses the soil is is more striking and really rather painful but it's the human dilemma um, that we aren't we were not born with an ecology handbook even the word the word i think was coined in about 1865 it's you know it's 150 years old Everything that humans do, humans are on a different trajectory than the rest of the vertebrates. And so we have to come to understand these things. So the fact that we know that we live in an ecological context, I mean, it's not very well known, but we're learning. It's, it's admirable that the human mind has figured that out. It's more admirable than figuring out rockets, for instance. <laughs> so ecology, you know, it means interrelationship. And it turns out the interrelationships are very, very deep. Um, so, Dana, excuse me. Do you want to present this as a slideshow? Because right now it's like we can see your. There you go. So, uh, my notes. Um, oh yeah. So it just struck me. It's hard to say. It's hard to tell another gardener anything really that's useful. Although I also think that. <clears throat> We gardeners should be talking together more than we do. Most, most of us just garden at home and don't learn that much from others. So it did strike me that if you learn any one thing that's useful in the garden from a one hour long talk, it's probably worth the hour because it's hard to learn new things about gardening. We have our ways of doing it. So that would be my hope that something useful comes up. We're going to touch on building soil compost, cover crops, mulch, weeds. We haven't talked very much about weeds. I don't have a lot to say about weeds, but I put them in here. Um, a little advice on tomatoes and potatoes because I've, I've especially had trouble with potatoes. And then um, also going a little, into a little more detail on extending the season in the spring and in the fall, because that's of great interest to me and something I've worked on and you know gotten my information from mostly from Elliot Coleman, who's done such a good job, the organic gardener in Maine, who's written a number of books. I show him a picture of him in his book coming up. Anyhow, I like the beauty of um, the vegetable garden, and that's why I put this in and this. This is at Farmer's Market. But um, really, to create transient beauty, it, what do they call that, uh, that the Tibetan monks do, sand, what is it, sand painting? Uh, instead of creating, instead of creating these art, art forms that, you know, then you have to find a place to put them and they use <laughs> the earth's resources. I like this kind of art. And so I, so this is, uh, this is a number of years ago, it's probably 10 years ago, but the, at that year, the eggplants were along that little grass path that I have at the edge of the garden. And so I just threw everything out on the grass <laughs> took a picture of it before I gathered it up because it was just so beautiful to me and it's really one of the delightfully rewarding aspects of gardening is the beauty 
So I found this actually, I mean, this is, it still looks like this, but it's a 10 year old picture, but this is what my garden looks like. And um, I was looking for something to show the contrast between what it looked like before I put the garden in and what it looks like now. And this picture really told the tale. Now there is a, actually a larger garden off to the left. The, the greenhouse is over. After I worked on this for, I was probably five years of not continuous work, but five years of project. Uh, I realized that the actually the good soil was off there to the left. And if you look in the background, you can see there's kind of a swale. The, the land dips out of view and then goes up that little short hill. There's a swale in there. And for various reasons, the better soil, the best soil on the property is down in there. And that's where the greenhouse is anyhow. So for this garden, there was no soil. And, and I had to build it and I knew it could be done. And so I started, as I've said, I screened it went through, had the screen on a box over the wheelbarrow and everything went into the screen, rub it, soil falls through, the rocks stay behind, dump the screen into a wagon and haul it out of there. And as I remember, I said before, I had to stop myself. It was so enjoyable to see that soil appear where, well, it, so maybe it wasn't soil immediately. It would have been sandy, some humus, not much humus as you can see. But immediately after the first year, once you start adding compost, you know, the color changes and, um, and it does look more like soil. Anyhow, I don't screen it anymore, but uh, it's just, it's amazing. And that's what life has done. Like, there was no soil. Soil is created by life. There was no life on land, so there couldn't possibly be any soil. <clears throat> In a related realm, there was no, I mean, this is just coming to mind and I'm sharing it because I just find it astonishing. There was no fire on the planet because there was nothing to burn. There was no life on land. The ocean doesn't burn. There was no fire. There was molten rock, you know, from volcanic activity. But for, for most of the history of the world, there was no fire because you need organic matter. You need that uh, hydrocarbon molecule that we've talked about where when the hydrogen joins with the carbon and during photosynthesis, it stores the energy of the sun and you can release that, you can release that by putting it in the soil and the microbes will break it down. You can release it by eating it. Just don't digest it too fast or your stomach will burst into flames or you can release it by burning and it's the energy of the sun that's being reduced. I mean, I mean, released. It's, it's a magical process. So, you can build soil anywhere. And this was fun. And part of the way that that's done. So compost is critical to good soil, I think. Uh, so I have this little passage, I forget where I got it. It's probably, I, mean, I have several passages here and I didn't put the source. It doesn't really matter. It, you know, it's a question of whether things sound true. And this is, this is not earth shaking, but it says, producing quality compost is the most important job on an organic farm. Well, uh, that's even mildly arguable. It could be cover crops or there could be other ways to do it. But just to emphasize how important compost is, we talked a little about compost. So this particular pile, this is what it looks like right now. This is about three weeks ago, um, mid-April, just when the snow went off it. But so um, I build that compost pile every October. It has all the plant material from the garden. I haul in manure. Uh, and I've been known to buy, a, I've been known to buy a um, ton of hay. You know, it can be one hundred fifty dollars. It's not that much. It lasts a long time in these smaller gardens, and so that's part of the layering process. And I pile it up. I cover that with a tarp. It's already covered. This one is now covered with plastic. But I'll take that off once a week and water it because it is so dry here. You know, it's a, we live in a semi-arid environment. You can't have it dry out. So I, I think I have a list coming up. Just the three things you need but it needs moisture. So that compost on the left was thrown out. That was in there for a year. Most of the compost I already put in the garden in October and that, you know, I can easily use that up. And there's another one of these out at the greenhouse garden compost. It's just important. It's a, it, like uh, taking rocks out of the garden. This is pleasure. It's just so unfortunate that our, our culture doesn't know how enjoyable gardening is. So I showed this picture 
once before at least this is a bigger version of it so you can actually read the text in it but you're after a balance of uh, carbon high carbon and, and some nitrogen there's not much that's actually high nitrogen in fact the next slide shows if it's high nitrogen it's 10 10 to 1 carbon that's high nitrogen that might be chicken manure i think chicken manure might be seven to one that's as high as you get and you know if you yeah so coming up with nitrogen is a bit of a trick but anyhow, you want to lay, so green plant material is much higher in nitrogen and it can be for just regular green plant material doesn't have to be legumes and have to be peas, can be 15 to one, 20 to one. Well, what you want is 20 to one. Uh, so you're layering green material with dry material. Dry material, as the next slide shows, is more like 30 to one straw. The nitrogen volatizes, it just evaporates and goes back into the atmosphere. And then he's got soil. I don't put very much soil in. For one thing, I don't want to dig a hole in my garden, but I put a little soil in. It also makes compost heavier when you're digging it out. But there's plenty heavy anyhow, because it has to be moist. Anyhow, you layer it. It's not that difficult. It does not have to be exact. It does not have, but, it, but let's see what we have here. So these are, that, that chart shows the carbon nitrogen ratio of green material on the left and brown material, just dead plant material. There were a couple of things that were interesting to me. One is uh, halfway down the green side is grass clippings, 25 to one. 25 to one is a perfect ratio. And what you, it's, it's like, where did that come from? Well, where did all of these rules come from? How, why are electrons attracted to nuclei? You know, and why do they want their shell? It's just, there's a, there's a structure to the universe. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. And so this particular, what I'm bringing up here is where does this ratio come from? 25 to one is a perfect ratio. Why? Because that's the way it exists in the natural world. And that's what by bacterial, bacterial decomposers adapted to over time is this ratio that tends to show up in the natural world. So what, I've, what struck me about grass clippings, I do mow. I have a strip around my garden and a little other bit of other stuff. And I empty that basket and dump it in front of the compost pile. And when I go to move that, say five days later and throw it on top of the compost pile, it's already decomposing. It's white, moldy and hot if it's, if it's a foot deep, you know? It's just because the ratio, it's just evidence of how useful that, how appropriate that ratio of 20 to one, 25 to one, 31, again, doesn't have to be exact. But look on the, right side the brown material why don't you want to put wood chips on your garden well the ratio is 70 to 1 there's no nitrogen in it and it will take it will start to decompose at the surface of the soil but it will take nitrogen out of the soil now that's wood chips are some people swear by wood chips wood chips are not a, a sin wood chips are organic matter and they will break down and they will improve the soil but it'll take time so if you're going to put wood chips down, you should add some kind of nitrogen. You can buy organic nitrogen. You can buy chemical nitrogen, which is not the worst thing in the world. It's out of the atmosphere, but it's made with natural gas. The energy used, rather than using the energy of the sun to make the nitrogen you buy in bags, they use, they use natural gas. So it's a fossil fuel product. But the actual nitrogen comes from the atmosphere, which is 78% nitrogen. But in the atmosphere, it's all locked up. Only certain bacteria can crack it open and make it available. Nitrogen fixing bacteria. So, and then on the thing on the left, twenty-five percent and seventy-five percent. That's not the ratio you want. Uh, I forget exactly what they mean by twenty-five percent there, but. Green sources like grass clippings are already high. They're perfect, as we have said. If you're using brown sources, then you need an addition of nitrogen. Uh, at the bottom of the brown side has shredded newspaper. I would not use shredded newspaper because of all the ink chemicals in the ink. I've never used newspaper. Uh, so it's just, uh, that's how you build a compost pile. And I found it fascinating and it, it definitely works. And so I don't, turn my compost pile it's too heavy it's tons those that compost pile my guess is five tons i don't know how it's 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 hard to get that stuff out of there in the fall so what you need to do 
uh, I put it in here somewhere and I forget where it shows up, but it, it needs the right ratio of carbon to nitrogen about 25 to one, 20 to one, 30 to one, not, doesn't have to be exact. It needs to stay moist. Nothing will decompose without water. So that's why I water it and cover it with a plastic. It also needs oxygen. So the plastic cover is not the best for the oxygen, but you can put in brown plant material, something like straw or uh, many of our garden plants are become almost woody and they, they'll make a structure that allows oxygen to stay in the pile. And that's how to get oxygen into the pile rather than turning it. So mine doesn't break down 100% perfectly, but I don't care. You know, it break down plenty well. I even meant to take a picture of it, but I forgot to do it. Cover crops we've talked about, I just want to reiterate, because the compost is important, but cover crops, the thing about cover crops is you can have several tons of plant material and you don't have to lift them. They grow themselves and then you can, they'll fall over or you can flatten them. You do need some way to deal with that material. I, so I grew both of these last year. These are not my pictures, but that spring rye is already coming up here at my house this year on a, on a different plot, but that's what it looked like. It was beautiful stuff and grew fairly thickly and crimson clover I've grown regularly. That's a legume, fixes nitrogen. The clover doesn't, but the bacteria associated with the legumes that live on the roots of the legume, fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere and make it available to the living world. So then <clears throat> it's just easier than compost. You don't have to move it, but you do have to deal with it. I have a tiller and I till it in, but there are the more I read, the less enamored I am of tilling <clears throat> cover crops. So how do you find out about cover crops? Well, that, that, that uh, little pamphlet on the left, if you were to Google that title, Understanding Cover Crops, you get it for free. You just download it as a PDF. The one on the right is at the Methow Naturalist on the bottom of the right-hand column. So the naturalist has a column on the left and a column on the right and a picture in the middle. <clears throat> and if you go down the right-hand column at the bottom, there is some gardening material and this uh, cover, it's called Cover Crop for the Methow. It's been there a long time, but it gets information on what crops are good to grow in the methow. So this, you know, if you if you Google cover crops, you'll be inundated with material. But these are two easy to use resources. <clears throat> Soil, I did show this before, but I like it a lot uh, because we think of it. It's think it soil is dirt, but it turns out that it's forty five. The ideal combination be 45% mineral, 25% water, a lot of air, and then the organic matter. And if you compact it, the soil loses its capacity to hold water and air. Let's see if the, so air is green, the compacted on the, is on the right-hand circle. Uh, it's very obvious to me that now in the garden that compacted soil is highly undesirable and it arises very easily. Compacted soil arises so simply, you know, just from walking along the row. And so this idea that Elliot Coleman came up with, this is a drawing from his book of 30 inch wide rows and 12 inch wide pathways is a good idea. And I'm doing it this year. It's the first year I've done it. And actually I have a picture coming up of what the greenhouse looks like right now laid out like this. And it's a nice scene. It's a nice scene. And I like it a lot because I stay off of the growing rows and I don't compact that soil, which I loosened up with a broad fork and tilling lightly. Now I till lightly. And I only have a tiny tiller, that mantis I have. To mulch or not to mulch. So I brought this up. <clears throat> this is, you know, all these things need to be decided by the gardener. And it's kind of nice that you, we get to work things out on our own. And I think the answer at this point is to mulch and it's been pointed out to me and I see it from the way that the ground responds. Nature doesn't like bare ground. There's only bare ground. There's only bare ground if it's a road or if it's arid. I mean, I have bare ground on my property because I have so many, you know, it's rocky and it's arid. It, doesn't, it hasn't rained since snow melted and may not rain for a long time. But if there's moisture, 
then nature covers the ground and, and it improves that ground over time. It builds the soil ecosystem. So that actually on the right is what is my garlic right now next to the greenhouse. Uh, and I mulched it in the fall with the wheat stubble that I had left over from that wheat crop that I grew because, um, you know, you plant here, you plant garlic about October 1st, could be a little earlier, could be a little later, but then it's, it's two inches down. And then if we get zero degrees and no snow, it could harm the garlic. And so I always put a fairly thin mulch over the garlic. Now, the disadvantage to mulch, two disadvantages that I'm aware of, maybe three disadvantages. One is if you don't mulch deep enough, it makes it very hard to weed. The weeds come up. If it's not, if the mulch isn't six inches deep, weeds will come up through it. If it's two inches deep, you can't use your hoe. It's very frustrating because the mulch blocks it. You have to pull every weed out by hand. The organic matter, as we mentioned, this is wood chips. Organic matter will start to take nitrogen out of the soil. Not in a big way. It's just something to be aware of. You might want to have good compost in the soil that has some nitrogen in it if you're going to use a mulch. And there might be wheat seeds in the mulch. Last year was a minor disaster. I mulched with the hay that I bought. I mulched the garlic with the hay that I bought. It's full plantain. I'm still pulling plant. Now I'm pulling plantain out this year, even in the greenhouse where I didn't mulch because wheat seeds get around. Now you can see uh, there's something coming up in the middle of that garlic row. It's wheat. I mulched with my wheat. <laughs> I'm getting wheat. Well, that's easier to pull out. I'll get it out of there, but plus and minus. The huge advantage, two huge advantages is one is you are adding organic matter to your soil. You didn't have to compost it. It will break down over the course of the summer and it, uh, re it reduces the stress on the plants. And that is coming up here. That's important. Plants do not like to be stressed. They like it even less than human beings. And the less the plant is stressed, and that's how, what I'm speaking of is less change in soil temperature, the malt and less change in moisture. That's really important. So advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to buy a ton of hay and mulch this year. And it's a lot of work actually getting that mulch out there. Also, you can't mulch too early. You can't put the mulch down in May unless it's garlic. You know, garlic grows in cool weather. But if you need the soil to heat up for tomatoes, you cannot put that mulch down until I wouldn't put it down until July 1st. Till the soil heats up, weeds. I actually Googled that line, what to do about weeds. I just wanted to see what they had to say. And oh, in pictures, I guess I wanted, I wanted some pictures of small weeds. And all I got was marijuana. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Everything, I mean, there were like a hundred pictures of marijuana, <laughs> no weeds. And then I remembered while I was working on this last week, Chase was out in the greenhouse weeding. What a perfect opportunity. So I went out and I took a picture of the bucket and I didn't, it didn't turn out quite the way I wanted, partly because it has beets in it. <laughs> what I wanted to show is we weed, you want to get the weeds when they're small. That's what to do about weeds. Get them when they first germinate. Spend a half an hour a week weeding your garden and you won't have any weeds. I mean, it's really the way to do it. Now the Beets are in there because, remember I said, and it's the case, wheat seeds, I don't know why they do this, I should figure it out, they have two or three seeds in that little, what looks like a, excuse me, a beet seed, what looks like a beet seed is two seeds or three seeds, so they come up together, well you can't have three beets growing together, you have to thin them, so Chase was thinning them, that's why there's beets in there, but otherwise we're getting those, those weeds are an inch tall, and we're getting them out of there, and then the beets now, there's a picture coming up, the beets, that particular bee row completely covers the soil. There'll be no more weeds. Also tools, tools for weeding. I really like the stirrup hoe. I use it all the time. And I like the wheel hoe. I don't use it as much, but it's very handy. Like between corner in the corner rows, super tool, super expensive, but you know, you only buy it once. It's like $250 for, okay, what are the options <laughs> for weeding? I forget where I saw this. Some program I watched and I grabbed, it was a video and I grabbed these two pictures. This is Roundup. This is, you know, this is a cancer, carcinogenic chemical that we spray on our soil. It's just crazy. Glyphosate is Roundup. I mean, we're, we're just crazy to do this when it's a pleasure to do these things organically. So don't use Roundup. <laughs>
And this is my one, hopefully, whoever tuned in here didn't tune in for advice on how to grow individual crops because I don't have a lot to say about it. You know, so, oh yeah, so where is that? I didn't number these, but. Uh, so here's a passage by Thomas Jefferson, a letter to his daughter. He said, how do you grow plants? That's the question. He said, when the earth is rich, it bids defiance to droughts, yields in abundance, and of the best quality. I suspect that the insects which have harassed you have been encouraged by the feebleness of your plants, and that has been produced by the lean state of the soil. I find it to be true. I mean, I, I experienced this firsthand, and I experienced it most of all with potatoes. I have a hard time growing potatoes. I get scab, and I get, I get this color of potato beetle in abundance, in abundance. And I will go out every day and pick collar or potato beetles off there. It's a big job because, you know, I try and grow for enough to sell. You can, then they have scab and I can't sell them. The problem is not my soil, which is good. The problem is for me, because I, because I water with the solar system and, and sometimes, sometimes the water is limited in quality, you know, when it's 95 degrees. Potatoes don't like 95 degrees. Potatoes are a cool weather crop. Potatoes don't like to be stressed. <coughs> when they're stressed, you'll get scab and you'll get Colorado potato beetles. The solution is to mulch them. A cool weather crop like potatoes love mulch and they can be mulched early. Doesn't have to be, don't have to wait till July 1st. And adequate water, but with mulch, you've solved the water problem because the water doesn't evaporate as much with mulch on there. So the problems that I've had. So last year, I noticed that so distinctly. I have been tortured by the Colorado potato beetle. And I had these beautiful potato plants last year that just were so healthy and grew, you know, two feet tall and bushy. And there were no Colorado potato beetles on because the plants were happier. And I did mulch them and they had adequate water. <coughs> the same goes for tomatoes. And I put them in. Well, I thought that was an interesting graphic. That I, I've never actually done that, plant the tomatoes horizontally. You, I'm sure you know that when you plant tomatoes, you plant them up to the first true leaves and the whole stem below that will, will, will root. And so you get a larger root system, but I hadn't thought of planting them horizontally. So here's your tip that you're getting from this video. Plant them, you know, um, you can lay the bottom part of the plant out horizontally and the whole thing will root more effectively probably than putting it straight down. So I've had problem with blossom end rot. The, the, the bottom of the tomato gets a rot spot on it. And it'll of course ruin the whole tomato. And once again, I'm, I've learned the problem is stress. For me, it's a problem of keeping enough water on there. And the solution is mulch. You can't, you can't mulch tomatoes too early because they need warm soil. Once the soil is warm, you can mulch them. They still need water, but they don't need as much. So that's my advice for those two crops. Mulch, mostly mulch. So extending the season. Uh, we've talked we've talked about early spring. We haven't talked about extending it in the winter, which is in the fall into the winter. But this is a review of spring. So I took this picture. I would say this is about February 27th. And there's ski tracks here. I ski. The only way out there, the snow is two feet deep. The only way out was to ski. There's a little lump. You can't really make it out in front of the greenhouse and that's the mulch, the compost that I dumped there in the fall. I've done this many times, so it's buried in the snow. So I just dug it out. I, you know, I went into the greenhouse, there's no snow in the greenhouse. You can see it piled up outside the greenhouse in that picture. And I started working on the soil on February 27th, February 28th, it goes up to 70 in there when the sun comes out. You know, it's 25 outside and 70 in the greenhouse. We're compost, composting the rows. These are wider rows laid out in Elliot Coleman style. And then we planted and there, I had no water. The water line's frozen until the snow melts. And so I showed you this before, but I think it's very amusing. We watered with snow and it worked fine. And then we covered everything, that picture on the left with row cover cloth, which moderates the environment. And Elliot Coleman says, you change your growth zone by three zones. So Mehmet is often said to be zone four. I think it's zone three because I bought 
zone four plants and they've died many times. They're like wildflower type plants that you buy from nurseries. Anyhow, it's zone three or four. He's saying you could change your zone by three with this double covering of a greenhouse. And it's not, you don't have to have a greenhouse. You're probably not thinking of buying a 50 foot long greenhouse, but a, a uh, cold frame, which comes up next here in the pictures, but then using the row cover cloth as well. So this is what the greenhouse looks like today. Uh, I took this on Monday. You know, so going out on February 27th, and, and you cannot do this outside now. Uh, this plants are, I'm eating salads now. I mean, I cut off, I'm thinning the lettuce and thinning the beets and thinning the spinach over there on the left and eating salads. So I'm extending my season, you know, in to April. And I, I have a few things planted outside and they haven't grown an inch outside. <laughs> they will now though, with 70 degree weather. But you don't have to have a greenhouse you can use cold frames and you can buy a cold frame or you can build a cold frame and they're easy to build. Although I have not built one and I have, so that upper left is a, called a jewel. It's just a brand name. And I have two of them and the next slide shows mine. Uh, and then I saw that it was Googling it for these pictures. And I see there's one called BioStar. It's the same thing. They're easy to find. They, they're somewhat expensive, but I've had mine for 20 years, you know, so I might've paid, I don't know what they were. I don't remember. $60, I don't know what they were. They're double walled, polycarbonate, double walled. So they're insulated. Here's the thing, they have automatic lifters. That little metal device in there is, is, is heat activated. Uh, I don't know how it works. They say they have paraffin in the little black cylinder. It expands when it heats up. It pushes a lid up. The plants love it. The plants just love that low stress, moderated, temperature. The problem with a cold frame is if you don't lift the lid, it'll go up to hundred in there and it'll kill everything. So the, the little, the homemade one, you have to go out and open it. So these things, these lifters, I remember they were guaranteed. I bought one extra one because they were guaranteed for three or five years. I've had them for 20 years and I still using the same one. I don't know if I could find the extra ones I bought because it was 20 years ago. So these are my cold frames. They're two jewels on the front porch and they opened themselves yesterday i took that picture yesterday it was you know sunny as soon as the sun comes out they heat up they trap solar energy they open up plants love it and so i have my starch in there during the day i carry these trays in and out and i was sort of i have eight of them four in each and you think that's a lot of work what i've noticed is it's a pleasure you know it takes it might take 10 minutes i get to look over each tray i get to feel from the feel, you can tell you get to nurture these plants. And I've, you know, worked on them a little bit. I even, I actually pricked out a few plants where two, two eggplants came up in one, one container and none came up in another container. They use that word, prick it out. And I picked it out with my pocket knife and I put it in the other one and it did fine. So I get to work on these plants. I don't mind it in the slightest. And so they're out there right now. The lids are probably up. And I'll take them back in tonight. It's like taking rocks out of the garden. It's fun. So this is another way to moderate the climate. And this is one that I don't recommend so much. But this particular one, this, this uh, low tunnel, the one in the upper picture there is actually covered with row cover cloth instead of plastic. I've always tried plastic. And so there's one problem is that you can't keep it up all winter. So this is a picture of me 10 years ago. I wanted to plant early. I probably didn't even have the greenhouse. And so I had to dig it out. I don't do that anymore. The plastic is very hard to keep in place. The wind just rips at it and it's hard to keep it in place. Row cover wouldn't be simple, but the problem with plastic is as with the cold frame, it heats up too much. It gets too hot in there as soon as the sun comes out. And so you have to, you have to baby it all day long. And then the wind comes up and blows it away. I've had the whole, those things, there's rebar stuck in the ground and those poles go into the rebar. And I had the whole thing blow out. So I don't really do it too much anymore, but I have, I've been known to put them inside the greenhouse and they work great in there because there's no wind. So extending the season into winter. So that we were talking about early planting, planting on March 1st. That's when I plant March 1st, easy day to remember. That's why I went out 
February 27th. You can have crops outside. Tough, the brassicas are tough. You could have probably have, you could have this, that large leaf spinach and dig it out of the snow. Obviously, you know, you can have carrots in the ground. The only problem with carrots is the gophers like them if they're still in the ground and they'll go down the whole row. Uh, yeah. So there's lots of, lots of information. This could be the best book by Elliot, because it's by Elliot Coleman. He developed this technique more than anybody else. I Googled it the other day. I forget why. And I, other books came up by other people, but you can get the information. This is Elliot. This is Elliot's greenhouse. I think it's in the winter. That looks like snow piled up here. And this is what you can do. Now he's in Maine. He's, a, he's, he's his own four or five. It's milder than here, but it's cold. It goes to zero. It doesn't go much below zero here anymore, really. <laughs> Coldest at my house this year, winter that I remember was seven below. You can grow these crops with double insulation. You can grow these crops. I forget where we go. So the, uh, it's just reiterating, you can have things outside in the snow, go out and get them. Coal frame doesn't have to be a greenhouse. Cold frame is not so hazardous in the later in the year. It doesn't get so hot. As I said, a cold frame in the spring, like now, you need to be there to open them or they'll fry everything. What else? And uh, so this is a greenhouse and he's, this is Elliot Coleman's and he's got, he's got his row cover cloth rolled up there. I think I have a, well, I have a picture coming up of how he does that. When do you plant? If you want to plant, Elliot Coleman says, and I have found it to be true, the challenge with planting for winter is the timing. You have to get the timing right. So August 1st is a good date to remember if you're going to plant in a, in a cold frame or in a greenhouse or in a low tunnel for crops that are fairly rapid, like lettuce, spinach, and arugula, but it's not soon enough for other crops, which you can grow uh, for winter consumption all the way into December, but you have to plant them a little earlier. So June, I have June 15th, if you want broccoli, broccoli takes a long time, start it in pots and then plant it out when it's big enough, carrots in the ground, July 15th, beets and onions, same thing. So, you know, the trick that we're talking about is these plants will grow in August and September and the first half of October, and then they stop growing, but they sit there and all of these things can freeze. That's the trick. So if you go out to the greenhouse, the coal frame on December 1st, and it's five degrees and the lettuce is frozen, if you cut it, it'll wilt. But if you wait until it warms up, it's fine. It's undamaged. Spinach, undamaged. Arugula, carrots, largely undamaged. You don't want carrots to freeze too often. You can mulch the carrots. That's the trick. You grow these things to full, full size, and then they just sit there until you want to eat them. And so we've done that. This is not, this is Elliot Coleman's greenhouse, but he, it's a double cover. It's once you, once you get into say midway in September, you want to double cover. You've raised your, your growing zone by three zones. Or you can put a hoop house in the winter in the greenhouse. You can put a hoop house in the greenhouse. I've done that. And they're great because then the wind's not a problem and they don't overheat in the fall the way they do. So here's a drawing out of Elliot Coleman's book. And he made these little wire rectangles. He just sticks them in the ground, number nine wire, I think, and sticks them in the ground and holds that row cover off the plants. And another thing about row cover, in my mind, <clears throat> row cover is, is a petroleum product. And you know, it, it's the, le the less we use industrial products, I think the better our relationship to the planet. <clears throat> And, but they'll say with this row cover cloth, they'll say it'll last three years. I find that it lasts 10 or 15 years. It's not out there all the time. You don't leave it out in the wind getting ripped to shreds. You bring it in in the summer. It's out there when you need it. If it's in the greenhouse, it'll last for many, many years. And so for myself, I mean, the greenhouse itself, the plastic degrades and I have to throw all that plastic away. I have, you know, I don't love that at all, but I'm willing to do it because it extends the season. Look at that time fly. <clears throat> Soil, wow, just a great subject. So seeing what I wrote there reminds me. So here's a passage out of a book on soil. I forget who wrote it. I just So the most productive ecosystems on the planet in terms of biomass 
are marine estuaries, tropical reefs, and tropical forests. But the most productive ecosystems in terms of biodiversity are the soil under our feet. One teaspoon of healthy temperate forest soil, so our forest, contains one million to a billion bacteria. We're talking about a teaspoon. Miles of fungal threads, invisible fungal threads called mycelia, several hundred thousand amoeba, several hundred nematode worms, assortment of microarthropods. It is said that all terrestrial life lives only six inches from desolation and death because all terrestrial life is dependent on the teeming biological activity of the top six inches of the soil. Uh, it just is fairly breathtaking. So these are four ecosystems. This is a pine forest here, and then a short grass prairie, and then a no-till agricultural and a conventional tillage. And it's showing tons per acre. Over here on the left is tons per acre, one, two, three, 13. I'm gonna break there. So the purple is bacteria. And so the main point here really is that the soil is just loaded with life. And so we're talking about more than 13 tons of bacteria per acre, acre in a short grass prairie. Now, it's interesting that there's less bacteria in the pine forest and more fungi. Well, that's because trees are made of cellulose and lignin and bacteria have a hard time breaking down cellulose and lignin. I mentioned that once before, our coal forests, our, our coal deposits are hypothesized to have appeared 300 million years ago because plants develop lignin and there was no organism that could break it down. And so the lignin just piled up in swamps and created was later in, in, piled up in such depth that it created our coal deposits. And there are fossil trees in coal. It's not unusual. So that's why there's more fungi in the pine forest. So in our garden, I could put a circle here for, that's not a circle. Sorry, it's getting excited. I tried to circle no-till ag, just, uh, and it's got a little bit of the short grass prairie word in there, but it's not the short grass prairie, it's no-till ag. So the main thing there are the earthworms. There's more earthworms in the no-till ag than in any of the other ecosystems. I guess tillage, we're actually tilling up the earthworms, chopping them up to bits. And earthworms are the most valuable thing, probably. If you had to pick out one organism, it would be the earthworms. And, and they're worth reading about what they do we're not going to go into it but they are so good for the soil well they have to have organic matter they are processing the organic matter in the soil no organic matter no earthworms i had no earthworms in my soil when i started and they magically appeared when i got organic matter in there here is what the terrestrial environment looked like before there were plants most of the history of the earth there were no plants there were no plants until about 450 million years ago but there were several billion years before that. It was, it's called regolith, which uh, I don't know if I can find, I looked, oh yeah, it means, if you translate that from the Latin, it means rock blanket. It's a blanket of rocks over the earth. There's no organic matter in it and you need to be hard pressed to grow anything in that soil. And here is some, it's not quite regolith, but it's the beginning of soil. So this is a rock out of my porch that I took a picture of. That's not my porch, I put it on the ground. Um, Olga will recognize this because we had, we had uh, several of us were looking at this rock and several others. We we're trying to count how many species of lichen are on this stone that's down by the river. It's not, it's not in the river because it, lichen wouldn't grow there, but it's up, you know, five feet above the high water mark. It's covered with lichen. So this is the beginning of the colonization of land. This is how it started. It probably started with lichens, which interestingly enough, are a symbiotic relationship between algae and, and fungi. They, they live together in these little communities. So these are living organisms living on this rock. How can they do that? 
where do they get their food? Well, what is food for a plant? It's carbon dioxide. So no problem with that. They need nitrogen. There's nitrogen in the atmosphere. The other thing they need is moisture. Lichens can dry out for 11 months and grow the one month that it's not frozen and it's wet in the met how. They, they slowly, that's a piece of granite, they slowly eat away. They produce acids that eat away at the ground. This is the beginning of soil. It's probably how it started. But it progressed through the process of photosynthesis. This is an artistic rendition of the power of photosynthesis turning the energy wheel that creates organic matter. Starts out as glucose. We've talked about that. I like that picture. And this is what we get you know, from the process. This is what has evolved from the process of photosynthesis. Plants contain the energy of the sun and the elements from the atmosphere. It's worth reflecting. I emphasize that. We are near the end here and slightly over time as usual. But this process, this is what, yeah, so this is, there's a skeleton there, several skeletons, so we don't like to see skeletons. But the, what we're talking about is a, a process of life and death. What is humus? It's dead plant matter. <laughs> what, do, what, does, what do plants have to have in the soil to grow? They have to have organic matter. The organic matter has the energy of the sun embodied in the chemistry of that plant material, that dead plant material. And that energy of the sun feeds the soil ecosystem, which then breaks down the plant material and makes it available to living organisms. So it's, it's a built-in cycle of life and death that makes us uncomfortable. And I think it's worth reflecting. I don't know if there's any way to get over it. And we're, it's not like we're going to get like death is going to become popular. <laughs> but it's the nature of the planet, and there's a lot of beauty to it. And I think that we can move in that direction. I think it's ecological education. It's, it's a slow process of waking up to the reality of the planet. Everything cycles. So I like this little diagram. Carbon cycles. There's a carbon cycle. There's a phosphor cycle, nitrogen cycle, water cycle oxygen cycle but more than that cycles is a slightly more complicated picture but we have a hydrosphere of cycling water we have a biosphere of life cycling the atmosphere cycle the gases cycle in and out of the atmosphere and most impressively at the bottom in red lithosphere the rocks of the planet cycle i mean it is you have to ultimately consider at least mildly mystical i think i mentioned in the first program i don't mind repeating so the sediments of the of the land run to the ocean they they become part of the ocean crust there is no ocean crust that's older than 200 million years the, the earth is 400 is 4 billion years old and there's no ocean crust that's more than 200 million years how's that possible it's recycled by plate tectonics and it comes back up as volcanoes and mountains and then you need something to grind it up so how about an ice age i forgot to mention but Tim Flannery, who wrote a great book called The Eternal Frontier, I mentioned it, uh, An Ecological History of North America. He says, if you want me to, to tell you about your soil, how good your soil is, tell me when your last ice age was. Because soil grinds up rocks and makes the elements that had flown off the land into the ocean came back as, play tect as tectonic activity. The glaciers grind them up. <laughs> it's a trip. I'm telling you, it's a trip. So a cycle of life and, life and death. It's an artistic rendition of the cycle of life and death. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about gardening. And I put a line through it because it makes us uncomfortable. And this is where we have room to grow. And I put in this graphic, like, you know, I'm trying to go lightly on this idea of humanure, but you see it relates to the cycle of life and death. The elements that gave us our lives and pass out of our bodies are the same elements that the plants need to grow. It just needs to be composted, but put a line through it because we don't like it. it makes us uncomfortable. Well, let's get over it. <laughs> so here's a quote by Alan Watts. Most of you remember Alan Watts, fairly wise man. You know, without this cycle, all we'd have are stat, everything would be static. It would be like the surface of the moon. The earth would be like the surface of the moon. We live on the most blessed dynamic planet, probably in the universe. It's very likely that we do. So this is the last slide, two quotes. 
And this is Michael Pollan. And I had a series of quotes, and this is my favorite one, actually, because it's so simple, straightforward. If we bother to try, that's an interesting way to put it, we can provide for ourselves without diminishing the world. Right now, we're taking a pretty heavy toll on the, the planetary biosphere, but we can learn. That's the assignment. Learn how to live on the planet without diminishing the world. And then as a slight joke, I like this passage here. I think I said it once before, to be happy for a week, get married. To be happy for a month, kill a pig. Why? Because then you'll have pork for a month. To be happy for a lifetime, plant a garden. That's a good quote. So that's it. Oh, except for the end. All those videos, you can search Meta at home on YouTube. Thank you, Dana. Excelente. That was so great. Oh, I just have so many questions, but I know we have a lot in the chat box. So if we have time, or maybe I'll call you later with my questions. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can figure out this checklist. What should you do with the extra rocks? Oh, you would ask me that. Well, what did I do with the extra rocks that resulted from screening? Can you people see those questions? I can. I don't know if everybody else can. What did you do with the extra rocks? The answer to that is they were, you know, they, interestingly enough, they were all river rocks. I mean, not exactly river rocks. They were all rounded cobbles because all the Methow Valley is so heavily glaciated. I took them over to the edge of the river and dumped them in the river, which is illegal. And that's what I did. But I thought that's where they should be. It's in the river. So you would ask me that question, but at least I'm honest. Where do you get the green for the compost the first time before you have any plantings? Yeah, well, it is a challenge to come up with uh, the organic matter for a compost pile, especially as the organic matter gets bigger. Well, you can buy, I meant to mention, you can buy compost, like if you're in the Methow at, at Cascade Pipe, for $120, you can buy a thousand pounds of compost in a tote and put it in your little trailer that you, and bring it home. And it, it, you know, there are issues with it, but it's good stuff. The big issue is, as far as I know, it comes from Boise, Idaho. So you had to transport it about 800 miles. That's kind of weird. And it's, you know, anyhow, you can buy compost. Um, if you're just getting started, so just one answer to that, and not that you're gonna go out and do this, but um, Elliot Coleman, will grow a cover crop. He'll grow a, an annual rye, which I've come to like, and I showed a picture of annual rye, and he'll plant a legume under that, like that uh, crimson clover. Well, legumes grow slowly, and so they like a nurse crop. So Elliot will go out with his, that, that rye will get two and a half feet tall. It's beautiful stuff. He goes out with his scythe, and he cuts that um, spring rye, and that's his green, material, green plant material. He puts it on the compost pile and then the crimson clover comes up. So you have two cover crops, but you've taken the first one off and put it on the compost pile. Well, you could do that. You don't have to have a whole field. You could do that in a plot in the greenhouse. You'd be improving the soil. You probably need a little more land. Now, if you live in the city, you might not have that available, but here, just dig the rocks out and you have, <laughs> I mean, I've got nine acres. It's just all covered with rocks. Different newspapers. Yeah, that's good. I some have more bullshit in them than others. <laughs> well, that okay. I don't know if you can see that. Do different newspapers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post have different carbon nitrogen ratios because some have more bullshit in them than others? Well, that is very funny. <laughs> and it's true we have been raking up wheelbarrows full of pine needles are they good compost so they were on that list and let's see louise i can email that to me to you if you want that 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 graphic i had of chart and i remember pine needles were like they were something like 100 to 1 so they're high carbon but the but i i remember reading we're hesitant to use pine needles because they're acidic i I read they're not that acidic. The problem with them is they're such high carbon, they don't break down. They need nitrogen. You, need to, I, you, can, you can buy organic nitrogen. The problem is there's things like blood meal. I mean, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. I can't stand a black blood, blood meal. But you, or you can just buy nitrogen. Don't tell anybody in a little bag. <laughs> but you need to get the 
uh, if it's 100 to one, that's too high. It just won't break down. Pine don't break down. And that's why it's the ratio of carbon to nitrogen is not adequate to break them down. Is hay bale a good source of straw? Yes, very good. Although straw is better. Hay is hay and straw is straw. Straw is, you know, uh, wheat is the wheat stalks, wheat stalks, and they're hollow. That's the thing. Uh, alfalfa hay is probably not hollow. So wheat straw is better in that sense, but it's going to be higher carbon ratio. So both are good. I, I would buy either one. I'd be happy to buy either one to, or get it for free. And there's spoiled hay around. I saw, I mean, I saw this pile of spoiled hay down on Benson Creek. It's, it's half rotted and I can't find the guy who owns it. I want it. You know, you just get eyes for this stuff. Holy grail of cover crops be the right choice of, wouldn't the holy trail be the right choice of natives? Are there natives? Yeah, so Robin, you may have asked that question before. I couldn't think of any natives that would be as good. Uh, you know, it's because we're in this, what we want is abundant growth and we live in a semi-arid environment. And so our plants are adapted to semi-arid environments. Now, one plant came to mind and that's what we call Great Basin Wild Rye, that huge grass that grows in sub-irrigated places in the meadow and the swales. It grows, it'll grow more than six feet high. Well, give that a try. <laughs> that might work. And, you know, I know Rob Crandall plants it. It's, I don't think it's hard to grow. So that might be the one. Great Basin Wild Rye. It's huge. Our water has a pH of 8.5. Wow. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah, seven. Seven is neutral. So 8.5 is acidic. I mean, alkaline, yeah. How do you combat this? If most, yeah, most plants prefer slightly acid, just below seven, 6.5, 6.8. That's what I read. Uh, buffer it. You're going to have to add something in a, comes out of a bag that has an acidic quality to it. I can't think of what that is. Uh, you know, we can think of the, the, base things like limestone you can add limestone if you have too acid of a soil oh uh no there's there's uh sulfur granules that i buy yeah i buy for my blueberries which don't do my blueberries don't do very well but i you need to acidify the soil blueberries like five to five five very acidic you can buy it in a bag at the feed store sulfur and it'll say how much to add uh, on the bag I have row covers 30 years old. The Douglas squirrels love it. Do they chew it up? Yeah. So he's, Robin is, is referring star cycle. <laughs> yeah. I put a picture of a fish on a bicycle and then I decided it was too corny and I took it out, but fish cycle too. <laughs> salmon cycle, salmon cycle. <laughs> um, so you said you bought a ton of hay is it organic and how much is that uh the ton of hay i bought was 140 dollars from a place just outside of winthrop uh that guest house place i forget what it's called uh it was cheap because it, it was slightly it had its small issues i forget what they were but he couldn't he couldn't sell it to horse people he wanted it for horses it was it had all that valerian seed in it. I, I probably won't buy hay from him again. I mean, I would. It's I don't know how much hay is. It's it's not. It can be two hundred a ton easily. I would pay two hundred. It lasts a long time in a garden, even my big garden. That's a lot of hay. You know, it's enough probably for two years of mulching because it comes apart. You know, it's all compressed and it you want it puffed up. You puff it up. That's the work. It takes time to break those bales apart, but it's worth it. So yeah, I'm gonna be, I saw a sign, it was hard to find hay in the fall. Oh, because of the fires, a lot of the hay went to the people who lost, uh, I don't know if they lost hay or what, but I, I couldn't buy any in the fall, but I saw a sign up the other day, hay for sale. Anyhow, hmm. we got plenty of hay in the summer around here. Okay, well, I have one other really quick question. You said to plant broccoli, kale and chard in pots June 15th. So why aren't you planting them in the ground? Well, they, uh, yeah, you could plant them in the ground. Uh, it's, I find them a little delicate in the early stage. And so if I plant them in a pot and I can take care of them until they're, you know, just three or four inches tall, the way you buy them, maybe if you buy them in the pot, uh, they do better. That's the only reason. If you can okay. successfully, 
and then you and then you put them in the ground and then you have them the for the fall this is for a fall early winter crop yeah. you might get broccoli to head out in september and then it'll stop growing it won't flower it'll just stop growing i've never actually done that because that timing's a little delicate but okay. that's how you would do it okay great great so, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you all for being here today. Have a wonderful sunny day out there. Wonderful sunny day. Yeah, thank you for listening in and participating. And good to see everybody. And yeah, if you want to be happy for a lifetime, get out there in the garden, but you better do it before noon. It's going to be awfully hot today. <laughs> and I've also convinced Dana to do a, a, a garden tour. So... We'll keep you posted on that one. Yeah, that would be fun. And whenever, you know, June, June's a good time. Garden probably looks the best in June. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Great. All okay, right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dana. Uh, All right. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.